Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ on this, the second Sunday of Advent. As we are making our way towards Christmas, the texts are very important in terms of their order. Last week you saw how brilliantly the church begins its year of grace by having Jesus come into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. For many people this seems counterintuitive at a Christmas time, the beginning of the church year, to start with the, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. But what it teaches us is that Jesus was born to die. Now we sort of continue the themes that went on in November, the themes of judgment, through John the Baptist. And today we will focus on the baptism of John and his relationship to Jesus. And next week you will hear the Midrash, that is the interpretation of Jesus of John's baptism in Matthew chapter 11. To, but to begin, let's do a little structuring here of the text so we have a sense of how it is that we'd like to put this text together. Um, verse 1 sort of stands on its own as an introduction, and you can see that clearly here. Um, Matthew begins with these words that, of course, reflect in, in, in those days. That, that These are the eschatological days. These are the end time days. And this first verse shows us that John, notice the historic present here, arrives, and he's described as the baptizer, the Baptist. Now, this same verse is going to be used in verse 13 of Jesus. And what you have, then, by means of this historic present in verse 1 and in verse 13, are these two salvation figures, John and Jesus, arising, uh, arriving on the scene of salvation history. So this is in a sense, you know, an, in, an introduction to the, to the fact that we are now entering into the eschaton with John and Jesus. Then the next section are verses 2 to 6. And here you can clearly see that, that what we have before us is um, the the, the fact that John the Baptist's baptism is a most, a most important one here. Let me see. Um, always takes time to get used to this. Maybe if I do this. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, two to six here. And here you can really see very c clearly that what we're going to have described for us is the, um, is the baptism of John. Now, th this text, as you can clearly see, is loaded with theological language. I mean, it, it is just rife with it. And, and I, think, I think you have to see how clearly um, Matthew is, is giving us words that we would put sort of in our ecclesiology. Now here, obviously the word repent, this, this is the great word in, in many ways of the gospel. Luke, of course, has for the forgiveness of sins. I'm always going to be referring to Luke here, but repent. And then the notion here that the kingdom of God, the kingdom, excuse me, of the heavens, I'm in Luke again, the kingdom of the heavens is drawing near. Now, I, I think here, here's perhaps, and I'm not an expert on Matthew, but this may be the first time we see the, the language of the kingdom. And, and this, this language now is going to set the tone for the parables all of the kingdom stuff now is going to show us the nature of the reign and rule of Jesus in the world. And, and I think in many ways, and, and you've heard this from me before, but I think it's worth repeating, that when we're talking about a kingdom, we're talking about a king. And that king, of course, is Jesus. And when you're talking about a king, you also want to look at his coronation. And of course, his coronation is on the cross. And his crown is a crown of thorns. So when it says the kingdom of God has drawn near, a kingdom of the heavens, we, we can clearly see in the, the language of repentance and the language of kingdom that we are already here in John's preaching, focusing on what the first Sunday in Advent focused on, the end of it. 
Now you'll see that Matthew is a proof texter, and here is his proof text about um, <coughs> the, the nature of John's uh, baptism. And isn't it interesting, the chrethes, the, the word through the prophet Isaiah, very specific here, voice crying in the wilderness, and then the imperatives, prepare the ways, make straight his paths. Um, these imperatives define the ministry of John. You'll see that both the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of John are defined. And, and I think it's important to see that that definition really does affect the way in which we understand them throughout the Gospels. I am very, very taken up, as many of you know, with the language of the way of the Lord. Um, th this is the language of pilgrimage. The way of the Lord, of course, also points to the cross because his way is, is, is to Jerusalem and to his destiny. Um, the, the idea of pilgrimage also has with it, and the Christians are called this at the very beginning, the way, of, the way is, is a catechetical way, catechesis. Um, so, I mean, it, the, 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 the sense of way is, is how it is that we are taught as we make our way um, through life. And, of course, that's, that's the way it is with Jesus, too. The way of the Lord is a way of suffering. In Spanish, this is the camino. This is the way. And, you know, what you see here is that, that John the Baptist is going to prepare that way for Jesus. Now, he does not quote the full passage. Luke does. But what you see here from Isaiah is that the very topography of Israel is going to change now you know, in a sense, with the coming of John. And that's what John's preaching does. Out of the wilderness is that, that, that all the roads to Jerusalem now are without hindrance. You know, mountains laid low, valleys filled in, you know, make straight his ways. Um, the, these things are things that are being done so that the Messiah can make it directly to his cross. Now, now please notice, right here at the beginning, we have the cross in mind. It's amazing how, how John does that. Um, I won't say too much about the next two verses, although they give us more in details about John, and, and they're obviously ones that indicate the kind of person he is. He is an ascetic. He is a prophet. He has all the markings of it. He comes out of the wilderness. You know, His message is repentance. So there is going to be next week this sense of the, the, the funereal, fun, funereal, aerial, uh, funereal n nature of his message, whereas as Jesus comes with a message of a wedding, a bridegroom, but you can see, you know, the way in which he is, you know, dressed and what he eats is very, very much, uh, you know, in line with that. I have here in blue this, this statement here about how, Jerusalem and all Judea and all of the surrounding countryside. I mean, this, this is an amazing statement that the entire region is aware of John the Baptist preaching. I always refer to the fact that I think it's Josephus who says that people would come down, you know, from Jerusalem with their picnic baskets and their wine and their, you know, their brie cheese and sit there on the, on the hillside and listen to John preach. I mean, he was the greatest kind of entertainment in town. And, and I think it's very indicative here that, that this, this is comprehensive. Um, I, I also think that it's important to recognize how, how what Matthew does is return to the language of baptism. Not return, really. I mean, it's the first time he uses it except he refers to him as the Baptist. But what he does is, is he, he, he takes the message of repentance and he said, this is what it prepares for, baptism in the Jordan River um, and confessing their sins. Notice that, confessing their sins. So to repent, look at the frame there, is to confess your sins. And they, they repent because... The Messiah is coming to his cross. He's making his way to Jerusalem. I mean, 
you've got enough to preach on right here. This is the sermon. But anyway, we do enter another section here. And let's see if we can, yeah, we can do this. Um, you can see here in the next section now, we have a little bit more of a talk about John's preaching. And it's, I think it's a, a very indicative thing that his preaching here, I can't get it all in, but we'll, we'll move it along as we go. His preaching is something that I think is, is really um, a very much a part of what his message is. And notice that, and, and this is unique to Matthew, Luke does not name the Pharisees, you know. You know excuse me, he does not name the Sadducees, he names the Pharisees. But here you've got the full representation of the Sanhedrin, at least in terms of of people who are involved in the religious life of Israel. <clears throat> so everybody is there coming to be baptized by him. And I mean, th this is a remarkable statement that he's calling the, the leaders of Israel brood of vipers, you know, um, who, you know, warned you to come from the, the, the fleeing wrath, you know. Now, uh, I th th remember wrath is, is a reference to judgment. But, you know, even, even though this, this may refer to the parousia, I think the wrath of God is also a reference to the cross because this is where God's wrath is satiated. And, and I think it's important to recognize here that, you know, this is a reference to the fact that the fulfillment of the, the, the wrath of God is going to be placed on Jesus. And then there's something more, and that something more is going to be the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the fulfillment, but there's always more. And, you know, th there's a, a number of ways to, to in interpret fruit worthy of repentance. But I, I think the first fruit worthy of repentance is to sit, to submit, excuse me, submit to John's baptism of repentance and to confess your sins. I mean, that's the fruit. Um, this language of we have Abraham as our father, I mean, that, that, that takes in a whole bunch of stuff here in terms of the claims, you know, of the, 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 the understanding. I mean, and wait till we get to the Pauline letters you know, later on in the New Testament where Abraham becomes the, 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 the main figure in terms of the argument between the Judaizers and Paul. But I mean, what, what they're claiming here is, is genealogy. And the genealogy is the fact that that's where they get their identity. And genealogy, and genealogy is, you know, I mean, how you can be a true Jew is, is through genealogy. <clears throat> John's response here is remarkable. For I taste that you, God is able out of these stones. You know, now on some levels that we should take that literally, but as, as everybody at that time knew, stones were what Gentiles were referred to. So they claim to be children of Abraham, and John is saying that even Gentiles can be children of Abraham. So not only do you have the cross here, but the very mission of the church is in line here. That this is now a message that is for Jews and Gentiles. Um, and, and then the, the final you know, part of this section here, because um, I think the, the, the verses 11 and 12 form their own section. So yeah, we did get you know, the whole section here. So there's chapter, verses 1, 2 to 6 and then 7 to 10, 11 to 12. That's how I'd break up the text. Anyway, here in this last verse, verse 10, the ax being laid to the root of the trees, every tree that does not bear fruit is, is um, cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay? Now, again, I think when you see fire, you've got to think of the parousia, but also the cross, you know, that there is going to be a judgment on the cross against all sin. And, 
and, and that this is where the, the expiation, the propitiation, the atonement for all sin is going to take place. So, I mean, John is, is, is essentially preparing them here, as he was in his preaching before, for the cross. Um, let's now take one quick look here at the, the final verses, which on, for my money are in many ways the most important ver- verses of the whole, the whole text. Oops, that didn't work. Hold on. Oh, that's clear screen, that's why. Okay, here we go. Um, let's take a look at the last verses here, 11 and 12. I spent a lot of time in my commentary on these verses because um, I think they're very important. Of course, they're a little different here in Matthew than they are in Luke. But this is where you see, in a sense, where we're going to be going next week with Matthew 11 and the comparison between the ministries of John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, I put in blue here the two critical verses. I am baptizing you in water for repentance. Okay, and I believe that is not in Luke. Yeah, that is a, that is a a, a, a Matthean accent, and that goes back to the preaching: repent, the kingdom of the kingdom of the heavens is drawn near. But notice that John the Baptist is talking about his his baptism as being a water baptism, and you know I make a big distinction in Luke between all the baptisms, and I think what we see here is that. His baptism purifies, it cleanses, it's preparatory. He prepares the way of the Lord. But he's not initiating anyone. You don't become a Jew by submitting to John's baptism. He's getting people ready for this, as I always like to say, this incandescent breaking in of holiness. And he is is preparatory. I mean, he is not the guy. And he talks here about how the one coming after him, you know, Jesus, of course, um, he is mightier, his sandals he's not worthy to carry. Um, And then, then he makes the statement here about the baptism of Jesus. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, I, I don't have time to go into this completely, but I think these two things, the Holy Spirit is a reference to to the baptism of Jesus, where the Holy Spirit comes upon upon him. Luke has in bodily form, it's almost like an incarnation of of the Holy Spirit. And I think the fire, and again, Luke Luke has this a little bit clearer than Matthew in Luke 10, but it's, excuse me, Luke 12. The fire here is a reference to his cross. So that what you can see here is that Jesus begins his baptism in water, because it's John's baptism. You know, he submits himself to a sinner's baptism. We're going to be talking about that at the beginning of Epiphany, so you don't want to get into that too much. But he ends his ministry in a baptism in blood. So his ministry is framed by a baptism in water and a baptism in blood. And when you look at verse 12, what you can see very clearly, winnowing fork is in his hand, he will clear his threshing fall, gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And, you know, I mean, again, you can always look at this, you know, of course, this is a reference to the harvest. And don't you love this asbestos fire? I love that, asbestos fire. It's a reference to the harvest. But again, I, I think, you know, I mean, you certainly could go right all the way to the parousia, but is not the cross involved here? Is this not where, as it says here, this fire here, if this fire is a reference to the cross, maybe this fire is then a reference to the parousia, but there, what I guess I'm trying to say is this. When you're looking at, you know, the language of judgment, always include both the cross and the parousia. And I think if you do that, you really cannot go very wrong. So, in conclusion, this is such a wonderful way in this 
season of repentance, preparation, for us to really begin to think about how it is that, that in Advent we do come clean. We, we do um, repent. We confess our sins. And, and we remember our own baptism where we were baptized into the death resurrection of Christ. And that John's baptism, in a sense, becomes Christian baptism when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And it embraces Jesus' baptism, his baptism in blood on the cross, and it, and it embraces, you know, the, 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 the glory that comes with the resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost.